I feel like a rock star up here. <laughs> I've got to say that I, don't, I didn't start listening to BFM until I was asked to sort of uh, come on the breakfast grill. Um, so the first time I thought, oh, BFM, I've heard about it. Um, but actually, I, I listened to um, JJ and Ian. <laughs> Reason is because it's always a tough day. I need a bit of humor in the morning and a, you know, just to get me going and see the lighter side of life before I start getting into the real side of life. So anyway, yes, I, I've been involved in green um, a little bit. Um, um, I, I am uh, approaching half the century um, and um, I've had some experience doing some sort of uh, sustainable buildings. I wouldn't say sustainable because we were. It was always sort of um, we wanted to do sustainable buildings. That's with Securities Commission, but we ended up doing something that was very energy efficient instead because at that time it was just too new um, for for everybody to absorb. So I call this talk today "People, Planet, and Priorities" because about a year and a half ago. Um, a, a group of professionals, uh, PAM and ACM, got together and started to think about developing some tools and some performance indicators that would be, be something that could be a guideline in terms of how to go green, because nobody knows. There's a lot of talk about going green. And since then, um, we've actually put out a couple of tools. We have more than 100, uh, 120 um, projects that are signed up, um, and we've actually trained a thousand facilitators. Our idea is to disseminate as much knowledge out there to everybody about what it takes in terms of an overall picture um, to go green. Um, you know, sometime at the Copenhagen, the Prime Minister said that we should lower our carbon emissions by 40%. I never knew what that sort of meant, carbon emissions, until that point. Um, and actually, uh, last week I was corrected because what it means is actually just 10% carbon intensity. I still to know exactly what that means, and once I do, I'll, I'll disseminate that information to you. In the 1980s, you know, this would have been a scene somewhere up, upstream, you know, in Kedah or Klantan. Well, climate change or urbanism, urbanization, whatever it is, we still haven't dealt with the issue that we have floods in this tropical environment. So nothing has changed because in 2010, on the 5th of November, we have still the same picture, you know, black and white before, now just in super color available on the internet and we can see it, uh, what's actually happening. And perhaps it's not as devastation, devastating as what's happening in Brisbane, um, but it is still devastating to think that this is still happening and it's happening in our urban centers as much as our fringe areas. And I would say that a lot of our areas really about uh, development now is happening in our fringe areas and that's where the town and planning people are considering where th that's the big growth in terms of our country and our nation. So, you know, there's a lot of that talk about green and I, I'd like to think that we're moving and we're a little bit more mature um, and, and less kiasu and that we're moving beyond the trend and we're actually going to what we think is our common future and I don't want to talk about, you know, 20 years from now, I just want to talk about next year, tomorrow um, and today. Um, about a year ago, I gave a talk in, in Penang, and um, I said that transforming our cities and township communities really is about looking at other aspects, like it, it's not just new developments, it's also regeneration uh, projects. So it's a whole spectrum, um, because we are already at a sort of, not to say mature, but we are already at a state where we have to look at regeneration, and we don't have to go as far as Penang, we could actually go to Majlis Pataling Jaya and know that they're thinking about how to regenerate Pataling Jaya. So we have old townships, um, which we like, these sort of shop houses, and we have um, uh, urban centers that are wanting to be looked at in terms of how we regenerate. Um, we have newly created townships, um, you know, that spring up in certain locations. They may be 160 acres, they may be much bigger than that. Um, and it's interesting that we're still building in the same manner that we've been building for more than 15 years. Nothing much has changed except the quality of the finish and the price. But in terms of planning, nothing much has changed. So. Um, at, at that same talk in about a year ago in Penang, um, you know, KL or Penang, I said we, we really have still old habits and old technology. 
um, and we really will then just have predictable consequences. You know, nothing will change, status quo. So we have to really rethink. Um, so I, I was tickled pink when they said they're calling this thing uh, rethinking. Um, old habits and old technologies so that we can dramatically alter the consequences and we have to do it at a, at a much larger and much quicker scale. So we've all heard there's a lot of eco cities being developed. Some of them I put their, you know, six star rating. Mazda is a six star, six star rating because it's out in the desert. It's totally created. It's, you know, it costs us a lot of money to build and it's a showcase. So I call that the six star. But I call smaller developments down the road, like Aurora, Melbourne, perhaps, or the Sonoma Mountain Village, as one star, not because they're less better than Mazda, but because they probably cost less, and they're in real people locations, locations that people can semi-afford to buy a house. And I'm talking about that because in the fringe area, which is where, where we're talking about affordability, this is really where the impact is going to be, and this is where developers are going to make more more impact to people's lives. There are other examples of eco-cities, or what they call eco-cities, we'll come to that in a, in a bit, and those are in revitalized locations, so Europe of course is starting to change because they're already quite mature, um, and so they, places like Malmo or Freiburg, they're actually looking at sustainability, so it's quite new, this idea of township sustainability when we start to look at an integrated design as a whole. But sustainable townships, or I call it Banda Baru, we have lots of Banda Barus in Malaysia, and this would be typical freehold land, 1,500 acres, 20,000 units of affordable luxury housing, semi-detached bungalows, medium cost housing, shop houses, schools, hypermarket, green padang, that's it. Still now, from 20 years ago, we still have only the green padang. We don't have the green continuum, we don't have anything like that. So we really are still building the same thing that we've kept building. We, we only have single frontages, we don't have double frontages, we don't have a green space in front of us. So this, I think, we really should be rethinking. In green building, we started off doing new buildings, so we, we, we put out a tool, sort of a guideline, if you like. Um, offices, residential factories, we got a lot of comment that, oh, it's much easier to get a green mark um, goal than it is to get a green uh, a goal for GBI. Well, you know, I made the comparison when I had to actually do a certification of a building of a residential, um, and it's true when I had discussed with some Singaporean engineers, that ours is higher. Our thermal performance in our residential is much better than a uh, green mark. In other words, if I were to convert, say, something called the OTTV, the performance of that building would be 70 in an OTTV. That means the thermal transfer is actually is actually getting more, is actually hotter than what our standards are, which are 45. So it's no wonder that it's harder for you to actually get a green building goal, is because we've benchmarked to what we think is more of a global standard and not just energy efficiency. In 2010, um, we, are re we released at the end of that existing buildings because a lot of people say, well, it's only really 8% uh, of that covers new buildings. But in, in existing buildings, we've got a huge market and area, but a huge potential in terms of property, and that may be about 85. And maybe that only affects property owners, because you know what? The developers have already moved on. The developers are still in the new building, so they're, they're really in the 8% side. But on the other side of our existing buildings, which are the bigger footprint of 90% 90 90 of buildings, these are owner occupies, and the owner occupies have to know how they can transform themselves to be a bit more energy efficient and prepare themselves in terms of energy and fuel costs rising up higher. And we thought at the time then that it was time for us to think about townships because you know, in, in Malaysia, in Asia, in Thailand, in, in all this, we actually have these kind of big growths of township, maybe not to the scale of China, um, but um, we certainly have enough in terms of these kind of developments, and we thought that it was high time we looked at a framework that really looks at townships, and we are probably still in the early stages. We've released it in December, and we are taking in pilot projects to run with it because we have to see how it really works, and then it becomes formalized. This is the normal process to do it. We don't just try to put it out there and say, well, you know, try and work with it. 
Um, so what drives us? What drives developments? Um, it use, it's always the economic viability. Um, I hate to use the word profit, um, but you know it's always about economic viability as defined what, what works in the context of the present economic system. But where we now, we really look, we're trying to look at what is ecologically viable. If I had to put a price on trees, if I told you that you put 22% more greenery in a space and it will actually cool down the space by 2.5 degrees in a tropical environment. So not only green looks cool, but feels cool. Um, so we, we really should be thinking about the future biophysical reality. So my topic today was people, planet, and priorities. And essentially, this is a three model of sustainability. You go on the internet, there's various diagrams that will always explain the same things. Um, maybe uh, other people will use people, planet, and profit, um, PPP. It's, it's up to you. And, and the reason for that is to look at it as a sustainability, we have to look at really how much carbon emission that we're actually uh, putting out to the world. Uh, notice Malaysia that we're still in the green in this location here, so we, we seem to be okay. And you just say that all the northern parts of the area actually are all in the red. I use this diagram when I give a talk to uh, economic people because you know they can see what's in the red and what's in the green. They understand that perfectly. So it's about climate change and how that affects us. And, and we live in Malaysia, we live in abundance because we have plenty of water, we have plenty of sunshine, we have plenty of green, we have plenty of food, we have cheap fuel, we have, subs you know, these things are subsidized, we have subsidized energy, so we really don't have any kind of constraints and therefore we take a lot of things for granted. And I'm saying, why can't we as Malaysians sort of be proud of what we have and actually give this sense of importance. We don't have to be pushed into a corner before we can actually make this sort of change. So it's about, I call it community environmental responsibility, not CSR. I think the community can make that change. If for now that you went into the internet, I know that when I want to hire a car, and if I'm traveling, and I'm, if I'm lucky enough to go to Europe once every two years, um, I'd look up and I can actually see how much carbon emission and performance of that car. I can actually get a car that's a bit more green if I said to you tomorrow, the property department, the property NST will now put in the newspaper how much or how green your property is and give a performance indicator, that will change the whole thing. So I'm looking forward to the property people actually helping to, to make that change. Um, there is this talk about greenhouse gas emissions and um, how all that contributes in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and there's CO2 reduction measures. So now the language is changing. We started with green and now what's appearing is how can we do carbon sinks, how we, can we transfer carbon. I'm not a big fan of ca uh, transferring carbon. I'm a big fan of trying to mitigate it at source at the point where you, you're actually designing. So we are on planet again, and the issue here is about heat island. Um, when I did Telecom Malaysia, I spoke to Dr. Shamsani. Now he's, I don't know where he is. I've asked a couple of professors what's happened to him. But 20 years ago, he actually did a lot of studies on moderating the urban temperature, didn't call it urban heat island. And 20 years later, a professor in Singapore is doing all the studies, and he's showing you that uh, how much that would increase. So if we increase the green lungs, instead of having just 10% in a development, but increasing it to uh, a sub substantial more, and if you developers think that, oh, why are they imposing all of this? Perhaps we should just think a little bit differently. This is Singapore. I can't find one for Malaysia. I haven't seen the amount of study in Malaysia yet, so I'm going to use another tropical example because they, of course, have studied every inch of their island because it's just an island. So here's their heat, uh, heat uh, island uh, footprint. And they've taken it a step further. They've actually done a metric showing how much the temperature is at the urban centers and how much it is in the green areas. So you've got a metrics that you can actually measure. And then they tell me that housing estates with 22% vegetation can actually increase the ambient temperature in a housing estate by 2.32 degrees. Now, wouldn't it be that great? You can start with the passive size first before we start to look at air conditioning. And then we look at thermally designing properly buildings and we can bring that temperature down another two or three degrees and we put a, a couple of fans and we don't need the air conditioning. 
On planet again, um, we have to look at energy security. Um, and with that, we have to look at energy diversity and scalable. So now we in, in Malaysia, every, a lot of people know about district cooling, um, but a lot of people don't know about other forms of neighborhood utility. Um, I was interested when I went into the TED Talks uh, to have a look at you know, what everybody's thinking and talking about that in the Bronx, um, they were greening the Bronx, and that's because you know, they'd have no green. All their beaches, beach areas are basically full of utilities that are supporting New York City, and now they're slowly making greens. But neighborhood utilities don't have to be something that actually has to be you know, across on the other side or somewhere in the backwater area. Actually, neighborhood energy utilities have become cleaner and cleaner. In Japan itself, the energy utility areas are in the central of the city. They're not actually at the perimeters. Um, this example here, for example, is from Canada for the Olympic Games. Um, the, Briti the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympic Games, and they had to build all this housing. Now the change in mentality when they're doing Olympic Games now is how to become more sustainable. Um, and, and the idea here is after the housing has been built and the, the Olympic Games is over, the fun fairs all over, this will become a real housing estate. So in this location, they have this energy center just near the bridge. It changes to green when they're actually collecting all the sewage and, and changing that into energy. So it becomes green and becomes red when they're not doing that. So they're actually collecting sewage and they're changing that and that's in the cent city center. And this image on the right that you see here that looks quite beautiful at night is that energy center. So that's about giving some energy diversity. Um, and then on the issue of planet, we're still also on the idea that we have to reduce. Essentially, everything here is about optimizing. We, we're not going to be changing that people are going to have less family numbers. We're not going to change that we're going to have as much growth. But what we're looking is to optimize what we have. Um, we talk about water scarcity. Not many of you feel the water scarcity in Malaysia because it's raining all the time. But none of us is collecting that water. If we've got so much abundant water. I think there's one residential that's coming up now um, that's actually collecting water for all the residential units. And Pataling Jaya is looking, Majlis Pataling Jaya, is actually looking to implement and enforce that all new residentials will have water harvesting. And that's because um, the councillor there has already put it into his house. It works. It's not expensive. He's collecting water and he's, he's doing it. So he's, he's saying, why? if I can do it, everybody else can do it. On average, in Malaysia, we are one of the highest in the world <laughs> in how much water we use. Of course, 300 litres is not what you use, but in overall, I guess, it counts for in terms of industries, housing, and all the rest. Our total consumption rate is at 300 litres of water, more than the standard Singaporean, and we have so much water. So there, there, that, that, this is the problem about having abundance. We don't know about control. Um, the other aspect that we look at when we talk about planet is loss of natural habitats. This is Kuala Lumpur. This is the whole map of Kuala Lumpur, and these are all the green lungs that you have in Kuala Lumpur, um, uh, in the Kla Klang and Kuala Lumpur area, and this is coming down to Kuala Lumpur itself. Um, we have to give a value to ecology. Um, one of the aspects that we've touched on in the township tool is we're asking that you do a biodiversity uh, survey. This will be the first time, not a, just a TIA, but a biodiversity survey. Um, and it's no wonder that we feel that Kuala Lumpur has been changing um, you know, for the past 20 years. This is Kuala Lumpur's statistics in terms of how much green space it has per 1,000 people. 0 0.37 hectares of green per 1,000 people. And no wonder people who go to study in Melbourne said it's awfully green over there. And that's because there's two hectares per 1,000. So, when these numbers come, they tell me basically there's a sense of measure and there's a sense of loss. And where can we fill up those gaps? And these become basically index and ideas for the municipalities to set their own standards of transformation and land use and all the rest of it. So that's the big picture. 
So we should have green connectors and corridors to address biodiversity and increase in terms of how much green space we have so that we can mitigate the heat island um, and other aspects in terms of green. But somebody asked me if, um, if I came to a township and it was green, would I know it was green? And I guess everybody thinks there's going to be these whistle-blowing things. I'm going to have solar panels on the screens. I'm going to have all these technology. Those are technological things. I'm not, we're, not looking for just, we're not looking for the technological things. We're looking for how we look at the space and the planning and the ratios that we do in there. And we have to look at the other aspect, which is waste and decay. A lot of our waste, it was interesting, I went into WWF and they gave me all these statistics about glass and about all the waste that we're using. Um, we don't see waste as a resource just yet. And um, when a big master planner comes in and they want to look at a very huge area, I ask them, are you looking at waste as a resource? Um, no. So it, it's fairly new. Um, um, I guess is an idea, but in some other areas, this is already implemented. So, the other aspect is about people. Um, when we do planning, it's about walkability, and walkability is about distances. So, everything must be in a proximity that's easy and walkable within a five meter radius. This is, this is Kuala Lumpur in terms of population and population growth. Um, it's interesting now to see that we're at finally adding new MRTs and LRTs. Um, in the 70s, Singapore already hit, was hit by the downturn and decided to spend all their money on infrastructure and transport. They're having now their second burst of transportation growth in the nation. Um, they are an island state. They can focus on that. Yes, we're much bigger, of course. Um, this I'm always reminded. <laughs> But about people is about mobility and mobility choices. So if we really want to hit sustainability, we really have to consider mobility. 63% travel by car, 26 by motorcycle, 11% only by bus. Um, I don't have the statistics for, for the LRT. Um, so you can see that actually out of that, uh, we actually have more than 80% or 85% uh, that are actually traveling by their own transport. Um, but if we look at this carefully in this tropical environment, perhaps we really should consider the motorcyclists and we should come up with new types of vehicles that will address the motorcycle is basically the lowest cost of private transport. And if we can come up with a green vehicle that could actually provide, most of us just go to work and there's only two, one person in the car traveling to work. So how about we get something that's a little bit more comfortable, like a motorbike that's covered that could take us to work. Um, it's also interesting um, that in some areas, I, I was just in Putrajaya last week, and they are looking to um, provide green buses in the sense that they're going to now go to gas. Um, so whilst we're looking at reducing the public transportation, and that's going to take another 15 to 20 years to happen, um, the examples that are showing in small cities, this is Adelaide in the middle, they use a bus that goes onto a rail and then comes down onto the ground, so it actually feels like it's a rail system, and it runs on natural gas, and it's a really small city. Adelaide is not a big town, it's a really small town, but they can, they can look at alternative systems even in a small town. I have to give you real examples versus uh, hyper uh, examples. In addressing priorities, um, and because I'm introducing you to all of this, because once we come into what uh, we have inside the tool, we are addressing what are regional issues in certain areas. So priorities will be economic uh, values. Um, if you were doing a development in Britain, you actually have to put a business plan into the municipality in terms of how your development would work. In Malaysia, we don't do that. We actually build and then see how the business is going to be. Um, there are regional and local priorities to look at at different locations related to local statutory requirements, perhaps, uh, or community needs. Um, and then there's the issues of green governance in that areas. So the idea when we did the township is to basically have something that um, that, is, that can be used by developers, that can be used by people who are building in terms of transforming into a green development. Um, these are the three priorities that we talked about. 
um, this model of sustainability wherever you go. And the six criteria that we have are climate, energy, and water, environment and ecology. Um, we, we rate that as uh, second highest, if you like, uh, one of the second highest items. Community planning and design as, uh, as the basis of the planning. Transport and connectivity, uh, building and resources, and lastly, we have business and innovation. We, we, we allow this uh, idea of innovation um, and regional aspects to be covered under business and innovation. And really, the new paradigm shift in when you start to do this kind of uh, design is that it requires all these kind of people to work together and think in a more holistic way. Um, and certainly when we're developing this tool, we're actually talking to various people, all the people that you see there, we actually have on our committee just to sort of brainstorm on some of the areas that we're looking at. So the performance criteria are six, climate, energy, water that you've seen, and these are the point systems. Um, we released it uh, in December, a pilot. We're actually starting to take pilot projects. We have two that are going to be signing up uh, very soon because we want to test it out. And um, the issues under climate, energy, water, which I'm going to skip because I'm sure I'm running out of time, are things like heat island, efficient, uh, efficient streetscape, green street, uh, lighting, reduced water use, solid waste. Under the areas of environmental and ecology, um, the, the criteria there covers biodiversity, ecological survey, and everything all the way down there. Now you'll say, well, we have flood management and avoidance already. We have hill slope developments. These are all guidelines. Uh, well, hill slope perhaps not. A lot of what we have there, we have already as guidelines, but people are not enforced to use that guideline. So when they have a star rating, they may reconsider about using those guidelines uh, into their development. In community planning, um, we have the aspects of green spaces, health, uh, secure by design, affordable housing, community trust. These are just some of the items that you see there. Under transport and connectivity, of course you can say in your development, I don't have control on transportation. It's actually all to do with the government. But we are seeing the whole picture as sustainable, we actually have to consider these aspects of sustainability for the networks of mobility and pedestrian networks. On the idea of building and resources, of course it ties back that you should have low impact materials when you design the space, you're using quality construction, and then we talked at the end of it about how much of the building in that master plan would have to be green. More than 50% of the development area should become a green certified building or else why call yourself a green township? Similar to, if I go to an eco, 100% of the buildings would have to become green. So we know it's a step-by-step -step measure. Any of these tools that we put out by green building are things that actually change after two years. They get reviewed and then they be put up and we actually upscale the requirements uh, one by one. And under business and innovation, um, we look at innovation in terms of what you may bring to that development, um, other business issues, regionality, and of course having a facilitator work on that development. So I wanted to show you just some examples um, because we don't have examples in Malaysia. So I actually have to show you examples of what's happening out there. This is Aurora in Melbourne. And this uh, entire development uh, master plan, which obviously is done in phases, um, Charleston Green is one of the areas, and you can see here that basically, yes, in terms of planning, they've got more green lungs, more green connections, they still have some of the housing aspects, there's more green inside that space. They also have water recycling for the housing, for all the houses that use here, water harvesting, and many other aspects in terms of the development. And each housing area is mo not more than 500 meters away to a mixed-use town center, facilities and amenities, so that the public don't ha have a choice in terms of transportation when they want to go to the shops. 
I give you another example. This was a project we worked in in, in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia, as you know. Uh, more than three million people descend at one point on Earth for that one day to provide the Hajj. And in this uh, example, um, even in this location, we looked at the issues of sustainability, about how to bring people there, about a green transportation system to bring people there, um, in terms of targets of sustainability, in terms of how passive design from the center to the outside, um, and the targets to go to that. Um, we didn't win the competition, but certainly we were already thinking at a very big scale how you would actually look at different uh, landscapes and how you would implement sustainability. Another project that we worked on, um, we looked at essentially what it means from the very offset when you do these developments, you're starting to do a little bit more homework and a little bit more analysis. So in this case, um, for a tropical uh, design, uh, we look at uh, sun, the environmental analysis on solar radiation, we look at passive systems in terms of the urban scale, and then we look at the building. So we go from, from the analysis down to the passive design, down to the uh, architectural building, we look at the shading strategies that goes into that development, we look at the airflow that goes into that development, uh, how much urban spaces that we have, we look about water and permeability because, um, funny enough, in Mecca as well, they also have a flood issue. So the idea for somewhere like even in Mecca in the middle of the desert was, even though it may only happen every 100 years, is that the, the groundscape would have to be permeable. In Malaysia, of course, we have this in abundance, the issue of water. And you look at about the studies of water, landscape, and green spaces. You look about the analysis on the ground in, therm in terms of the thermal properties, in terms of the heat island effect. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Hopefully that'll transform. We're going to do a Q&A right now, but uh, before I throw the floor open, I, I, I have a short question. Not really short, I tend to be quite long-winded. <laughs> um, many developers are branding their properties to be green today. Um, yeah. A lot of them have uh, what you call in your presentation technological features, so like solar panels, energy efficiency. Um, do you think they're addressing the issue of how they use the space enough, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about green lungs? Because as you said earlier, we don't have a township to look at to say, okay, this is a sample. So in a, in a city where land is kind of scarce and uh, expensive, how do you think developers can address this issue? Um, I think that, the, of course, there's, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk out there. A lot of people call, you know, um, um, green cities, eco cities, um, and have a name attached to that. I think it's because it's fairly new. Um, in terms of how to look at a kind of more holistic picture, what are the overall uh, elements. It may surprise you to know that Marina Bay in Singapore, which is a new reclaimed land, and of course you will say, well, if it's reclaimed, it can't be green, but of course they don't have space. So take that side effect away from it, um, that actually the overall arching sustainable issues have not been totally looked at. You know, two different companies are coming in now to actually look at that. Now, I'll get probably a lot of arguments about this, but the, the effect is that it's, it is fairly new to look at all the components on this kind of scale. So people have used snippets of ideas of what is green, you know, if I put the solar panels on. I say that's a good start, but um, I need a sense of measure, and I guess something like this, and that's why, um, you know, uh, Leeds in America and BRIM communities, the Australians, they're all trying to come up with some kind of framework of measure. Even greenhouse gas measures are debatable at the moment. So I think what's happening is everything's still a little bit up in the air, and the dust will settle, and the measurements will start to be there. So it, it, unfortunately, we're in this 
in this area of transformation. So in your opinion, before the dust settles, because <laughs> it's a working process, how can developers kind of approach this? You know, wh where should they start? I mean, you know, the technological things they can kind of read up and kind of prescribe to it fairly easily. But when you're talking about use of space, you know, as you say, even Singapore, you know, new and they're having problems right now. So, you know, what are the baby steps that they can kind of take from, say, today, for example? Um, I think you have to go down to the basics and see what is it that you're trying to optimize. Um, are you trying to optimize on the space? Are you trying to optimize on your costs? Are you trying to optimize on what you give? Um, uh, I, I guess we hope that, you know, you know, that there's, it's all very nice doing uh, small developments and all the rest of it, but there is a majority of people that are not doing the sort of more holistic design. And we're hoping that just putting something like this, look, this is just a small, I would say it's a minimum indicator. You know, the eco-cities of Tianjin and all the rest of it say, all right, we're going to be 30% only use of portable water. That's the only amount of water that we will use, that we bring in instead of 100%. Um, so these, these, what we wanted to just do is put something out there that gives an idea of an indicator, and then you just improve on it. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> okay. Um, do any of you have any questions? Because, yes, please. Um, kindly mention where you're from and okay. your, um, your name and where you're my from. My name is Shakiran. I'm from Nazar TTDI. All right. Um, regarding the um, what caught my attention is your priority slide, and yeah. you mentioned very briefly about how other municipal councils actually um, ask project planners to present a business model to them yeah. before a, pr a project gets approved, but it doesn't happen here in Malaysia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why doesn't it happen here in Malaysia, and how far are we from that change? Is it a necessity for us to have that system? Thank you. Is it a necessity? Um, I think it is a necessity to look at that aspect um, because if not, you're you're basically hedging your development. You're, you you know you you will do your own market studies and see, but m municipalities and they don't they don't know. In fact, a, a lot of this is a learning curve. We've we've run five workshops, uh, four workshops with municipalities. And for them, it's also a learning. And they want something that they can see totally and then decide what is their going to be their index and what, is, what they're going to focus on. Putrajaya is lucky. They, they, you know, they, under the auspices of the government, they basically have to be a green city, Putrajaya and Cyberjaya. So they've already done their greenhouse gas uh, emission calculation. They know how much they're already producing and they know how much they have to cut. So I think um, the... It's still new ground. Uh, I, I got asked the question about regionality, for example. What are the regional aspects? And we're trying to put up a list. Um, it's not going to be an exhaustive list, but we're going to put out a list of examples of what are regional issues. Um, and then we're, we're going to try and bring that knowledge out, basically, to, to everybody. But business model, what does business model do? It, it actually helps, basically, for somebody like Madhuris Pataling Jaya know that what, what is their total population, what is their growth, what, what areas can they move, what industry can they put in, how much green can they put in. You know, they, they will then actually know as a whole. And those kind of studies are not even done as a whole. So Putrajaya is the first one that has just come up last week with their own study for for their city. Um, if that same example is done for every municipality, then they will get a bigger grasp about where their properties are and what the developments. But in the end of the day, there's land. And here, where there's land, somebody's going to fill it up. <laughs> um, so they will look at what is viable to build and what that location will sell. And, and that's how properties are looked at at the moment. Yeah. A question from here. Good morning, Sarida. <laughs> uh, this is I guess you know this him. This is a carbon emission guy. <laughs> this is the carbon sink guy. <laughs> yes, I do know him. Um, <laughs> Industry is very. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to be too caustic. Um, since this is, uh, yeah, I'm BK Sinha from C2C Project Managers. We are consultants in sustainable projects and practices. Thank you. Um, the question of carbon is, is relative at this point of our his, uh, time. So um, instead of that, I, I want to ask another pertinent question, particularly pertinent to this type of audience. Um, I have gone through several exercises and have discovered 
that the cost of going green can be cheaper than conventional construction. But yet, not from the Chartered Institute of Surveyors, or what, it, what are they called, the Quantity Surveyors, um, nor anyone else in the market has driven this theory forward and tried to prove it as being real. Uh, and I think that is a key driving factor mm -hmm. in going green faster. Um, Sorry, yeah, so could you tell us, uh, could you give us any, shed some light on this as to why this is happening? And if it is not true, how so? Um, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is often a question about how much it costs to go green. Uh, a lot of people say, well, if I got to do a certified building, how much is it going to cost me, Serena? You know, three, five percent, and then, you know, they'll stop at it. Um, when we got the tax incentives from government, that pushed the green agenda a little bit further. Because we don't have mandatory requirements in this country, it's, it's really quite difficult. Most developers think, well, if I've got to go green, it's going to be more expensive. You're absolutely right. I think that, but it takes a little bit more analysis is a little bit more thinking uh, when doing design and perhaps I you know there's a property uh, developer over here uh, that has been transforming his residential um, uh, uh, property into green uh, and, and this is semi-detached or detached houses. Um, I'd be interested to know, we haven't received figures yet um, in terms of how much the quantum is. Um, we have to wait to the next round where a lot of buildings are certified before we get a real feel about how much the actual uh, additional costs. But I do also agree with you that there are ways to cut down the cost. There's also ways to exploit the costs. In other words, that to expand the cost to be a lot more than what it really is. Um, I'm listening to projects that instead of costing X amount, it's four times that price. And it's, it's really shocking um, to me because what happens then is that we get a bad name thinking that to go green is really, really costly. It's really thinking about the passive elements. So um, in the example of the councillor where he's actually put a water harvester, it didn't cost him very much. He actually had to build the whole thing himself, but it really didn't cost him that much more. Um, and, and he reaps the benefits of it. Uh, Serena, do you think it's an issue of um, not enough communication or just that there are not enough experts in the field to kind of do a better judgment? Um, I don't mean to insult anybody in the industry, but it's just, you know, why, why is there such a disjoint in costings, for example? Because cost is a big issue in development. <laughs> Um, I, I think, you know, look, um, developers will find the ways and means to, to, to establish the green with minimizing the costs. I think they will. I think that um, uh, builders, architects, engineers have to think a little bit smarter. You know, I saw a presentation uh, by an American where um, concrete, for example, in the floor, instead of using that much more concrete, he's put plastic bubbles inside it. So I get a sort of, and, and put these plastic balls inside the whole floor, which means I use less concrete, but I get it just as strong because what I've done is I've just created a, a sort of more sandwich effect. It didn't cost him very much more, but it's less it's green. So these, these ideas, people haven't explored, explored enough, I think. Question from the gentleman here. Um, please say your name and where are you from? Uh, Michael Chow from Value Partners. We're in the mergers and acquisition business and we're watching the, the uh, property industry closely. Um, it's not so much more question, but just to follow on from the last uh, question, I, I guess from a commercial perspective, we tend to look at the source of the problem like you were talking about earlier on. Um, everyone talks about green and it's costing more. Nobody spends enough time, and maybe there should be studies done on how much more you can sell properties for from it being green. Now, if you do that analysis, there's the impetus for change, I think, as opposed to you know, looking at it from a community uh, environmental responsibilities perspective. You, if you show corporate leaders in the property game as well as governments that um, at the end of the day, everyone does well, including the developers who think right, I think the change will happen real fast, much faster. I need the consumers <laughs> and, 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 um, and people in the media really to push that out, I think. 
um, faster. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there are examples. I mean, globally, for example, like a, a lot of people are willing to pay a lot more for for houses in the UK, for example, if they're green. So I, I, I'm just wondering how long would that interest and passion trickle down in Malaysia? Because well, can, can, we test, mean, can we test that, that assumption? Can we test that as um, for, with, with this room? Yeah, um, yeah. Let's say 5%. Is 5% a reasonable figure? What? Five percent more to for to pay for a green property sustainable, um, or is it more, what's a more realistic figure? Yeah, I With think five percent. I think five percent is. 5 I'm looking is? at the developer in the corner there. Okay, so <laughs> let's call it a million ringgit. Well, these days a semi-detached house, terrace house. For certif for certif being certified. If you okay. want to go higher, of course you you're having to look at renewable energy, and because when you start to look at renewable energy. Renewable energy is still expensive for us in Malaysia because our energy is just too low. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But supposing, I mean, there is, um, there, you know, there, it's, um, it's a more sustainable development. Um, it's a five percent premium. We're talking about, say, a million ringgit dollar property. You're paying one, one million ringgit and fifty thousand, or two, or two million instead of uh, two point one million instead of two. Um, how many in this room would go for that? If it's, that's the only difference between uh, between the two properties, one is green certified as well as sustainable, and the other is not. Who would pay the extra premium in this room? <laughs> okay. Um, it's about 15 Very bad at math. 40%? 50%? It's about a third. <laughs> Less. <laughs> yes. So, there, there are, I guess, you know, there is no, some... No, but there, there are examples. Like, for example, to buy a house in TTDI would set you back quite a lot for a little tiny terrace house. And a lot of times when I ask people, it's because of the green lung. You know, people are willing to pay for that because they want to go to the park and run around. So there, there is value in that. I guess it's just putting it down to paper into a report for people to kind of look at, do you think? So um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a way of uh, proofing. If they go out and say, well, these are my features of my development. Um, you live in my house, it's two degrees cooler because, you know, my, my, the way my fenestration windows are happening. So it's, it's going to be two, two degrees cooler than any other house, you know. Why can't you say that? Um, your energy consumption depends on, of course, what, you, what um, stuff you put in there, whether you've got an eco fridge and all the rest of it, or you don't use a fridge or all the rest of it. So the appliances do play a big part in it. But um, I think I if you start to put out some of those, those features that you actually have and, and people start to feel that, yes, I've got a lot more uh, in value added into this development, then perhaps they'll start to look at it differently and developers will look at it differently. <laughs>